Hi, I'm Jay from Real Street Performance. I'm here with Jared and Kim Holt. Jared and I have been working together since 2016. We've made some progressions with his green super to the point that his wife really couldn't play with it. So he started a second super build and this is gonna be her car. It's gonna be pretty cool. You know, cars brought us together something like 20 years ago. And as our uh, relationship is, obviously we have kids and things now, our car hobby and our car passion, that's what we do. And so we wanted to build her a car that can run eights, have full amenities, power steering, power air conditioning, things like that. And uh, we're here to do that with Jay with some of the same pedigree parts that we had on the green car. Are you excited? I am. Yeah, I'm a little nervous. Um, I should know more than I do, but I'm excited. We all start somewhere. This will actually be the first two Jay-Z I've ever put hands on internally and built. So obviously no better person to do that with Jay. So I'm re really ready to dig in. Let's see what we can do. So what we have to put together today is a Massworks prepped 2JZ block. We have a Brian Crower lightweight 94 millimeter crankshaft, Brian Crower more I-beam rods, a Manly stroker piston, a set of heavy duty pins and a set of real street billet caps. We're gonna spin everything on a set of ACL bearings. We've got an oil pump prep from Toyota and we're all measured and clean and ready to assemble. So what's the first thing you do when you start thinking about building an engine? Do you make like a list and like steps? Like what's the first thing you look at? And well, the f first thing you should try to determine is a goal set and a budget. And then from there you could select parts. Like this is a premium crankshaft. Okay. This is an expensive crankshaft and it's for when you're trying to broaden the power band of the engine. So you're not limited. Yeah, you, you, you gotta have a little bit of money laying around to buy a premium crankshaft. So looking at a crankshaft through the build process and the goal process like if you don't have the money for this then then you can start to kind of simplify but i will use a stock crank and most japanese engines can use a stock crank without any sort of chaotic failures they're very t all these japanese engines for the most part are pretty tough so you know then you you, you know at a minimum you're going to be using an aftermarket piston because the material that the factory pistons are made out of they will crack and break and then the engine has to come apart. So these pistons are made out of a material that deal with higher levels of heat and stress and abuse. So you get a forged aluminum piston and then you generally buy an aftermarket connecting rod because this is another component that most factory engines will break this component. At a minimum, early in the process, you say, I'm gonna do pistons and rods. Well, in order to do pistons and rods, you've gotta facilitate that with correct machine work to the engine block. So then you need to find a machine shop, preferably someone that has a good reputation and good success with your engine. And then they do their work and then they give it back to you. You clean everything a couple times. And then on these engines, we make a um, billet main cap, which is replacing um, a lighter weight, more of a production style cap. And this is gonna help retain this crankshaft. So there's lots of prep work that goes into. Lots of prep work. There's lots of things that you don't, um, you wouldn't see if they weren't pointed out. Like this engine is gonna have a stroker crankshaft. So the bottom of the cylinders have been notched because the more the distance oh. between the center line of the crank and the th rod throw, the further it's moving that is the further it's moving it up and down in the bore, the larger the engine is. But as it, as it moves that rod further over and away from the center line of the crank, it can run the connecting rod into the block and then you've got a big problem on your hands so they notch the bottom of the cylinders to add additional clearance with these particular components and because you're dealing with different components not every engine will receive the same notch so there is a little bit of blueprinting that goes involved in knowing that you have a set of parts that will jive as a system it's very intriguing like of how yeah. everything works together and it's make sure it's compatible and you know like you said like the little notches like that's such a small thing but such a big thing at the same time well yeah because if that doesn't happen rods touch the block and yeah it's... like something so small can make such you know something we teach our kids like small things make make a big difference yeah and this is no this is no different no this is the same thing these are the how today goes will determine so don't screw up the lifespan <laughs> of the engine right. and the success of the project up. because a lot of people build engines unsuccessfully yeah. and when you spend all your money and all your time and you're hours and hours in and you start it up and you drive it for a week and it's broken again, it is incredibly discouraging. Yeah. And some people take a long time to financially recover from their own mistakes. So a lot of this stuff is just using some common sense, trying to lean on some knowledge bases and, and put it together as right as you can. That way, as you move forward, you've got a good foundation to have fun with. Yeah. Awesome.
Right so, on. Let's do it. So what do we do? We're gonna put bearings in the block. Okay. Why are the, the bearings so discolored from heat already? Well, that's like just that. the coating. That's the coating. So right? that's a common question that we get as a reseller of these bearings, and that is uh, why are they discolored? Now, the discoloration on the bearing is totally normal. It's just the coating. So if I put this motor together and I pulled it apart and I saw that, I think I didn't get my clearances right and I got oh. crank hot. Oh, no, no, no. This is so thin. This layer of the bearing is so thin. If you get it wrong and it's tight, it, all this stuff gets destroyed. Right. It doesn't, this is too soft. We could damage this with our fingernails. So what is this made out of? Is it like aluminum or is uh, it the, so soft? It's a multi-layer bearing. So there's there's different materials made making and different surface levels of the bearing. Not every level of the bearing is the same surface because you've got to have a, a strong structural backing to it. Uh, top layers are going to be softer because if there is uh, trash, you would like for that trash to be embedded into the bearing. Then the other thing is, if you look at this bearing, you see this groove or channel? Okay. So oil is right going to be fed from the oil pump into this hole. Okay, that's like and a little reservoir then somewhere. into this trough. And, and it, it, it is absolutely a reservoir okay. because the other side of the bearing just has these two little notches. Is that for and the set in there? Nope, that's, no. f that's to continue this reservoir. Oh, okay. Because when the bearing is on the crankshaft, right. there's no oil getting to this side of the bearing. So, but if that's a, that little notch there, I mean, is that going to really do much with it's the oil? It's enough to get the lubrication yeah. there. Just, just enough. You, you um, pressurize the oil into that channel and the crankshaft rides on a wedge of oil, pressurized oil. Okay. So that's where the clearance between the bearing and the crankshaft become critical because if you don't have enough clearance, you're going to make metal. If you have too much clearance, that, that wedge of oil won't be able to stay strong enough and it will disperse and then the, the metal components will touch. And then as you kind of put the bearing down, you can kind of wiggle it around in its shell and make sure it's seated because the other bearing, the, the mating bearing, the lower bearing is going to come in and it's going to push against this one. Okay. And that's what holds it into place. So this little notch that you see, this little tang, mm -hmm. this is just so I can get it in the ballpark. I it put it there. It it, I just hold now it's in the range. Now yeah. when the main cap goes on and it forces the upper bearing, it's going to actually locate this bearing exactly where it needs to be and it's going to push it down in there and that that's called bearing crush the bearings push against each other and that what that's what holds them into place so you could grind these tabs off if you wanted to put the engine together as long as you have the bearings located in the right spot when you bolt the other bearing in it's going to stay exactly there it doesn't the the tank so is a guide the basically bearing. it's a guide okay. yeah this is um, hpl makes this this is a assembly lube and if you look at it it's kind yeah. of a it's more it, gel it's, it's jelly looking yeah. And it's going to stay on those surfaces while your oil system gets primed. So we're going to lubricate all of the bearings just by getting some lube on them. Just give that a little squeeze and, and let it run down. No, it's okay. It's all oil. It's just going to get squished out because the clearance between those components, again, it's really small. It's under three thousandths of an inch. To be generous, but don't. Yeah, you, you, you're doing perfect. Yeah, that's totally fine. You just don't want dry. Perfect. All right. So now that we have that, we can pick the crankshaft up and put it in place. Now the crankshaft. This is a lightweight crankshaft. So when Brian Crower makes this crankshaft, it is seven and a half hours of time in just making it lightweight, and they take off I think uh, over ten pounds of weight. But if you look, all this material here is cut away. This is hollow through here, so it can and touch that my fingers. And that helps with the weight. Well, well yeah, if you're yeah, swinging, these, uh, less, these are balancing holes. Less rotational mass. Oh. But, and the other thing with this um, Brian Crower crank is if you look through this hole, you can see right through, right? Mm -hmm. That's direct oiling. So oh, okay. as this main... And the main, oil's going to come through here too, right, yep, you said? This okay. main is going to feed this rod. Okay. This main is going to feed this rod. And it just continues on down the shaft? Yep, and the stock crankshaft has more of a T. So what happens at high engine speed is the centrifugal force can disrupt the oil flow and the oil can't get out because this only gets oil replenished as it passes the reservoir or the trough in the bearing. Okay. Lower side of the bearing is just a slick shell. So that's busy trying to save its own butt. It doesn't have, a, it, it's not gonna be feeding that rod. You're feeding that rod as you pass through the trough. But this direct oiling on this crankshaft makes it for better high-speed oiling. This is really a work of art. They really do a killer job right. on this part. 
uh, great finish work, and you're spinning that weight. So if you think about it, this is gonna be turning 8,000, 8,500 RPM. A lot of speed, a lot of m mass and motion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so Jared just went and grabbed the stock crank. Don't look at the oil, or don't look at the grime. You know, this is a used car part. So this was metal that was pushed together under heat and stress. Mm -hmm. And this is a billet. So this starts as a round chunk and they cut, they cut this so basically. Truly this is was a art. tube. Like the, oh, oh sure. yeah. yeah, billet crankshafts are an art for sure. And these cranks are extremely strong from the factory. Oh like yeah. You can make a thousand mil horsepower on a stock. Oh, more than that. You can do that. The, <laughs> the oiling gets better with an aftermarket crank. Cause if you look, if you look down that hole, it just goes straight through. Well, uh -huh. there's an intersection halfway through that goes up this way. Yep. I think and I the oil that, has yeah. to get in there and turn. So the direct oiling crankshafts uh, are better for bearing life. And this, um, these crankshafts, because of the material and manufacturing, they're less prone to bend. So the worst thing about a Jay-Z, it's a long crank. And what happens is they bend in the middle. So we're gonna drop the crank in. Bearings are lubricated. You don't want a bunch of this. So you you wanna, wanna be smooth okay. and precise with where the crankshaft lands in the block. So you just lower it down. I'm assuming you want equal pressure across right. the board. And you're in. Done. These are the thrust, thrust bearings. bearings. Okay, so what do those do? The crankshaft has bearings that are protecting it as it spins round and round. Okay. But you also have a certain amount of front to back. Oh, okay. So these... Is that like a spacer almost? Yep. These bearings here are going to keep the crankshaft from moving too much front to back. Okay. So if you have a clutch car and you push the clutch, you push against this bearing and if you have a torque converter car and the torque converter is um, not correctly configured you can push against this bearing and wreck it if you ever got to drive a manual transmission car when you're a kid there may have been a person that says don't sit at a stoplight with your foot on the clutch it's because you're just applying the pressure directly to this bearing yeah we've been trying to teach her how to drive the integra <laughs> well the other thing is this engine has a so those grooves real quick or is that for more reservoir. more reservoir more reservoir more reservoir um, this engine has a 360 degree thrust. So you have a thrust on the bottom of the crankshaft and on the top of the crankshaft. So the crankshaft is protected um, on both sides. So your other thrust bearing would be right here and they go in the main cap side, but this makes it a 360 degree thrust. Your Integra engine and your, uh, little Acura, it only has 180 degree thrust. And what happens is if you damage the bearing, you get what they call crank walk, where the crankshaft can move in and out of the engine. So if you look here and here, this is gonna be the, the registers of the saddle. The cap is a little bit bigger than the area it's going. Okay. And as it pushes down into that saddle, there's interference fit, which is gonna locate this it. This is the saddle. This, no, this, um, this area here is this oh, okay, okay. the main saddle. Gotcha. So this, these two ledges, uh -huh. when this cap it's gets like pulled, oh yeah, when it gets down in there, it's gonna be pretty tight. And uh, that's what helps register the cap because the cap is, is held in place by the hardware, but it's also held in place by the main saddle. And it's located by the main saddle. Sometimes you'll see dowels where the main cap will be doweled to the block and it registers on the dowels and locates on the dowels. And most engines will just have a main saddle that it's the, uh, the, the interference fit between the cap and the block um, helps locate the cap in place. I'll bring that cap down slow into the saddle and you can watch how it happens. But it basically is gonna take, as the fastener um, tightens down, you're gonna pull the main cap down into the saddle and you're gonna watch that assembly loop like spooge out. Spooge. Spooge. Squish. I like that word. <laughs> this is just a electronic yeah. torque wrench. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's cool, it's gadgets. Yeah, that makes it extra expensive. Yeah. <laughs>
for just 20 bucks a week, you can have this torque <laughs> wrench. The rest of your life. The rest of your life. Yeah. We right, just buy so, repo boxes like I did. Um, so this, we're gonna just take the slack up in the fastener, maybe bring it to like 10 foot pounds. Yeah. Pretty strong. So now that we got that out, what we'll do is just take our screwdriver. Hear that? Mm -hmm. I heard it, yeah. Is that a good sound? And then you can look, see your, see your thrust washers are mm -hmm. free. These thrust washers, when they meet each other, there's a um, female triangle and a male triangle and they sit in, in each other. Okay. And so if you put the them in backwards, it just deadlocks. So, so even once it's done at eight, 9,000 RPMs, this is going to be floating like that? Yeah, it'll just be floating. I didn't know that. Yep, you can hear. And so how do you know what order, like where do you start? Like uh, I start on the inside, work my way out. Okay. Most, is, there any uh, is that just what your preference is? No, most fasteners, they have you do it that way. Um, if this were a bed plate engine, it would be more critical because you're bringing down a uh, kind of an entire fixture. You know, there are engines that um, all the main caps are one piece and they tighten all down together and you're gonna go from the inside out and kind of, you'd go like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you'd so work the way out. Order, yeah, but for this, I do my thrust first and then I just go out of the block. Go ahead and regroup and get, get your arm way out there and just turn, it. turn, 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 turn your whole body if you need to and get to that 60 foot pound mark. There you go. You One got more it. to go. So it just stays Keep smooth. going. Yep. Smooth. Mm. Smooth is the, the way. All right. Perfect. Now we're going to flip the engine over and we're going to assemble the pistons and rods. So we'll just roll this over. All right. So you're going to lubricate the pin bore on the piston. You're going to make sure that it's got a good amount of coverage of the oil because this isn't a forced, there's no oil pressure here. It's just oil that gets splashed up and it's gonna lubricate these parts. So you make sure your pin is lubricated. You get a connecting rod. There's a bushing in the end of the connecting rod. You're gonna make sure that it's lubricated. And then once you have the parts lubricated, you're gonna get a circlip and you need to load the circlip into the piston. So you have a little notch in the piston. You line the circlip up. So the circlip is covering that little notch use your thumb and you pull it tight down in the piston and you rotate it and you should hear a click. Okay. Once it clicks, you can grab your pin, slide it into the piston. The bigger valve relieves are the intake valve relieves and you're gonna put the notches of the bearing or the tangs on the bearing opposing the, uh, or on the same side as the intake valve release. It doesn't matter which way they face, you just want them all facing the same way. All right, go for it. All right, start the clock. I feel like I'm on like uh, a game show. Have you ever done this before? On a banshee. So you have practice. Ta-da. Check and make sure the pin floats. No, the pin itself. Okay, cool. I'm not stabbed you with the pick. This fish hook. Perfect. Ta-da! I got it. Look at that. But Okay, but question. Yeah. So I lined that up to the edge. Did that go forward too Doesn't much? Doesn't matter. It once it's matter. in that, once it goes down yeah. in that groove, it opens back up and holds itself in place. So that's just for getting it in, is yeah. when you got to line that up. The, okay. The only, that's just an access point. And if you're going to take the pick, take the clip back out, you, you get watch your eyeballs. underneath it and you pop it back out. So now it's time to put rings on pistons. We're almost ready to load pistons and rods into the block, okay. but we did have some assembly lube when the engine was upside down, making its way up the bores. So we're gonna wipe the bores out again. We have some automatic transmission fluid on a rag. And the object of the game here is to make sure that the rag stays red. 
Okay. If the rag is getting black, you don't have the boards clean enough. So you wipe and wipe and wipe and make sure that we're seeing red on the rug. You're seeing red, you're making sure all that's good because all those valleys in the solar wall can hold um, trash, can hold particulate, can, can corrosion can already be started down on those bores. So you wanna make sure that all that's wiped out. So I'm gonna do three and four, and then I'll turn the engine. Okay. But basically I have a piston ring compressor. I slide the piston, you know, the, the gravity will hold the rod from hitting the cylinder wall. So I just, and the ring is just keeping the it. ring is compressed by the ring compressor. This is a cone okay. that as you slide it down, it locates the ring so the rings compress as you go down. This is a gotcha. really neat tool. So you've got the ring compressor seated on the block and then you make sure the piston is turned in the right way because if you have the piston turned like this and then you go to put it down in there, you're gonna run the rod into the uh, block and into the crank. See how the assembly lube is kind of spooged out? Yes. That is different than the bolt lubrication we're gonna use on the rod bolt. So we're gonna go ahead and just dab that out of the way. Cause I don't want a bunch of that assembly lube getting down in that bolt hole because then it's gonna change my torque reading. And then this rod cap is married to this rod and there's a tang and a tang and okay, the tangs so face each other. But if I put this rod cap on this rod, I'm going to have a problem. So the rods are engraved an engraver set little number four. When I take the rods out of the box before I separate them, uh -huh. I engrave each rod with its partner beam and partner cap. Really? That way you don't mix them up. Same thing though. You pull the cap down evenly. So you don't just like tighten one side down and leave the other side loose because you're you're working the cap down over these dowels. So these will go to 10 foot pounds just to kind of seat the bolt. Mm -hmm. And then in one sweeping motion, I'll go right to the spec. Just a couple of ugga uggas. Huh? Just some ugga uggas. Brett taught me that term. I didn't know that was a term before. Uh, he said he calls them ooga doogas. Ooga doogas. Yeah. Yeah, I'm over here in foot pounds living in the 70s. I didn't know that ooga dooga was a thing. Okay. You'd go in the trough. Uh huh. Wow. See, you can Around decorate a cake good. Yeah, I think that when I retire, I'm going to. a pastry gonna, chef. A pastry chef, and I can just put on a bunch of weight. <laughs> be a pastry chef, and just be like, Yeah, you want to buy a cake? Suck. Here's your engine cake. But you don't want to, um, you don't apply silicone in that other trough because that that's the overflow, oh, okay. so it doesn't, um, so it doesn't clog up the oil passages. Then on the front of the block. There's two oil O-rings. So this is the oil into the pump. Uh -huh. and this is the oil out of the pump. And these O-rings are going to keep that sealed up. So you don't put silicone on the O-rings. They install dry. Okay. You do put some oil on the snap. crank gear because your front seal is going to snap over that. You want to have that lubricated. And then you take your oil pump. You've got some oil on the seal itself. And then we just go ahead and get it on the oil pump gear, get it lined up, work it over the seal. And then we can uh, put some bolts in. Let's see if I'm as good as Jay. Probably not. Already not. <laughs> <laughs> it's the little things. That's looking good. Um, it sounds like you've been watching cake shows. Well, it's, it's floating just, like royal icing. It's the way that it makes sense. I know it does. It's just, it's just interesting. That's exactly what they say. Really? Uh huh. Maybe I am gonna be a pastry chef. Okay. So we have to get this.
So there's another O-ring here. Toyota made it pretty simple. You just push it in. Push it in. You're gonna follow the path on the inside of these bolt holes because oil can um, can leak out. You know, you wanna be back here on it. That way you've got a, a pattern all the way around. Here to here, here to here. There's alignment dowels here. These are important. If your block doesn't have the dowels, you wanna have the dowels and then you can just kind of lower it down onto the dowels. And once you have it on the dowels, you drop it and it's in place. This and just spin them down. Sign your engine. So why do you put the date? Is it just like? Well, that way when it blows up, you know where your money, you know when they spent the money. <laughs> or if you never get it running, or it's two years from now, like we need to finish that car, and then you look at the date when you finish the well, engine. Well, you did the That's work. That's bad news then. Oh. You did the work. You signed. You we did all it. did it. You did it. Well, all three of us have signed it then. You did it. Okay, there's mine. Now you got to do yours. God, I know you. Bro, my boy uh, Tito, he used to like make notes in his engine. Uh -huh. Like he would say prayers and, and he would write it inside the engine. His engines are always pretty good. I'm just saying. <laughs> we only went like 188, like a long time ago with that thing. I put, a, I put a heart in everything. So we're going to use the Toyota head gasket. It's a multi-layer steel. It is important that you put it on. You have a hole that goes to your main galley. Oil is going to be pressurized up into the head. Mm -hmm. So with a factory Toyota gasket, when you lay it on the block, you're going to have a tang or tab hanging out over here on the exhaust side of the block. That's how you know you've done it right. And looking back on this, this should be a pretty similar engine combo setup than what we ran the, we went 757 in the green car all those years yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that was a long time ago, yeah. but- um, Stock block, you know, billet yep. crank. You can have a lot of fun <coughs> with this. Uh, this is a 625 headset kit. This is actually left over from the green car before you went to the billet block. So we've got a, a good headset kit here. We're gonna lubricate it with the ARP uh, Ultra Lube. When you put this lubricant on the threads, the object of the game is not to overuse because this is gonna end up in the oil, in because the oil pan. Yeah, you just wanna paint the threads. You wanna paint the friction surfaces and make sure there's enough present that when you assemble the engine, the friction surfaces are covered with the lubricant and then you don't have uh, unequal torque. Different lubricants will have different amounts of friction as you tighten the fasteners. Mm -hmm. By tightening the fasteners, it wants to shear the lubricant away. That's how you get, you get those marks. Okay. So the cylinder head is a Mazworks piece and that gives you a lot of really neat features. So if you look through here, a CNC machine does the clearancing for the high lift cam. So instead of some dude with a grinder, right. you've got a machine that makes every single thing exact. He taps the back of the cylinder head water port. So instead of having barb, where on a car with a lot of boost, right. maybe you'll have an AN fitting, maybe you change the configuration, but this gives you the flexibility and the process was done while the head was bare. So you, all the metal chips are out. Correct. He plugs this front galley plug, which would be going, um, it kind of daisy chains through the factory intake manifold to the EGR and IAC. And then you have machine for screwing and freeze plugs those pretty purple anodized plugs. And he also does the CNC port work on the ports and on the chambers. Yeah, it looks beautiful. BC dual valve springs and Toyota shimless buckets. So on these, the, the buckets, right? Is that the, what you said there? Yep. So they're numbered, are they, what, I'm assuming there's differences because you don't want to get them out of order of some sort, right? Oh yeah. So each one of these buckets, these are Toyota buckets. And if you peel one out, there's a number right there. So oh, so they're labeled. See that puck in the middle? Mm -hmm. The distance from the puck to the top of the bucket, that number tells you the distance. Okay. So if you get a, uh, a micrometer out and measure it, you'll land on um, 500, uh, 5 Are they like mil millimeters. So they're millimeter yeah. in measurements. So you go to 30 pounds first? Yeah, you just do it in steps. I do like the purple on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. when Mark was in the service, he was stationed in uh, Japan. So he's got a little bit of uh, JDM <laughs> going on. Now mine's gonna have a, a blow off valve too, right? Oh yeah. It's gonna have a purple one? Oh yeah. Okay, just making sure. Like your 3000 had many moons ago. 
That's my favorite part of this car is the purple ball valve. Yeah. I didn't care about anything else. I'm like, it's so pretty. <laughs> That's cool. It's the fine details. Now we can put the cam shafts in the cylinder head. So, and obviously, I'm guessing since this one's got a longer snout, this will be the one with the VVTi cam gear. So you put these in. You kind of have the cam pins. This pin is going to locate where this is because this all gets timed. Okay. If this is out of time, you can make a real mess. So I'll I'll put them where they're kind of like over at one or two o'clock, mm -hmm. and then I can bolt the cam shafts down to the cylinder head and then I can work on timing the engine. Right. So you need to do all of these bolts that have the 10 millimeter head to 14 foot pounds. Boom. And then this across yep. from it? Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. do each cap and then move out. Um, out. Center out, okay. Yeah. Boom. Watch your face. Watch your, watch your, watch face. I think that was a song in the very first Fast and Furious movie. Then you have this uh, on a VVTi, almost every single time you change the camshaft on a VVTi. See this nub right here? Yep. See where it's been clearance with the CNC machine? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. This is where you always have to check. It may not it may not hit the head on the max, the tip of the lobe going right. into the bucket, but right here on a VVTi, you're gonna have to take that nub off. 100%. Yeah. yeah. You know what that part is, Kim? What? The one he's putting on right now? the water pump it's what moves the water so on these bolts because the camshaft flows oil through it and it's hollow and oil flows through the camshaft mm -hmm. in the end of all the camshafts there's going to be either a knock-in plug or a screw-in plug okay. but you'd always use some blue loctite on the cam bolt because if that plug leaks on the camshaft it will leak out of the front of the camshaft so it's just Blue Loctite, it's in the service manual on the cam gears. Do that, I mean, I'm assuming the numbers on the outside matter? Um, so some kind those of are degrees, oh. so you can alter the the cam timing. See, the R is like retarded and then advance. So you can retard the timing or advance it. Oh, okay. Mechanically. And then you have, you know, you're gonna line these marks up here. Oh, and then on the BVTI sprocket, this notch needs to be with this. And that's how you're mechanically? Oh. Or the mechanical cam timing. Close. Close. Now, this is a new adjustable cam gear. Okay. Doesn't matter what brand it is. When you install a new adjustable cam gear, these bolts mm -hmm. assume they are loose. Yep. So Every single time. You, you have to check them because if you... Worst case scenario is you start the engine up and they're loose right away and you can hear it banging and it doesn't run the valves into the other valves. Or they're tight enough that you can start driving around thinking you don't have a problem and uh -huh. then get a big problem. So anytime you have an after rocket so cam pocket, you always check the hardware. Okay. It's, it, it's your responsibility to check the hardware. It's the very first time we worked on the green car. I had those old three bolt HKS styles. Yeah. Came loose. Yeah, the old purple ones. Yep. Yeah, those are, those are old school. I want to find this set and just keep them for nostalgia and like put them on a shelf because they're so cool. I remember I think like you could still buy them. Yeah, 
a non VBTI engine, you have 12 teeth mm -hmm. and every- They're larger too. Okay. And then this is smaller. 36 smaller. minus two. The more teeth that are on the crank gear or reluctor, uh -huh. the more precise the computer know the engine position, which comes in okay. handy with variable cam and with a uh, top control. So if you had a, you know, and there, there are trigger systems that you'll have like four teeth. It, right. Things get pretty crude. So this is another uh, critically important piece of hardware on 2JZ. So this bolt goes into the oil pump, okay. but it is a through hole. So this goes all the way into the engine. So you wanna put a little bit of blue Loctite on this bolt because it's another place for oil to leak. And then you want to make sure that this piece of hardware is not bent because throughout its use, it could, it could bend and then that'll throw off the, how the idler moves freely. You the, said there's a hole through that? There's a hole through the oil pump. Oil pump, oh, touches okay. the block. Yeah. Okay. Yep, and then the last piece is this is a very specific washer mm -hmm. that's gonna go on the back of this. So this, even though this is a fairly big bolt, this only gets tightened to 28 foot pounds. So you don't have to really um, lean on it. Lean on it, yeah. yeah. This is one of the uh, timing belt tensioners that we offer. Uh -huh. So the factory timing belt tensioner can break and when it breaks, the timing belt then is effectively like out to lunch and you can crash <laughs> the valves into the pistons and, and ruin a cylinder head. So this is a, a billet piece, a stronger piece. It's got a, a bushing that's pressed into it okay. and that bushing some people offer steel ones of these, but since the bolt is steel and the tensioner is steel, the similar metals will marry over time. So you need this it, this is the beefier frozen. tensioner, essentially? It's, a, it's just a well-engineered component and it has a steel pin pushed into it where the tensioner pushes on it. Okay. So this is an idler bracket, but the factory ones break and the aftermarket ones that are steel, if, it, if you don't have a bushing in there in a, in a steel part, it'll marry the bolt and then it'll freeze. Okay. Then you pull this pin out so that's holding something open, obviously. Yep. That's a hydraulic tensioner. Tensioner. And then you have um, kind of a guide washer. Okay. And this will just be on here. It'll just be loose and it does not have an orientation. Let's put it on. Wrap this bad boy up. The mixture is just aligned. Yeah. yeah, there's no wrong place to put it. Cool. So that's pretty much it. What do you think? Very in, like, involved. Lots of little Lots pieces, of pieces that make sure they go right. A lot yeah. of planning goes into stuff like this. The planning, the measuring, the cleaning, the bolting together part the is, part um, yeah, the prep work is, is the Most majority of the work. And yeah. then picking the right parts obviously go and a long the right ways too. To, to teach you. Yep. So I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you very much. No, I think this will be cool. When you get this in the car and you fire it up and you start to have fun with it, you, you'll have Baby a different steps. appreciation with it Baby because steps. you've, uh, you've seen it in, uh, in a, kind of an exploded yeah. view. You'll respect it more. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Uh, you already have a turbo kit? We do, yeah. Um, got the ETS turbo kit and exhaust, downpipe, all that good stuff. Um, and obviously we're gonna run a precision turbo. The next plans are to get this bad boy back to Oklahoma. And we're gonna be documenting on my channel, J Rod's Garage, from you know, from the very first time we got this car with rust and bullet holes in it. We've already put some content out there to putting this in, the ATF trans, the 8.8, the Detwerx fuel system, the suspension. I mean, it's gonna be a full documented build on our channel. That's cool, right on. Well, I hope you guys have enjoyed this video. A uh, little bit of a departure from what we normally do because we got to kind of have some students in the classroom. So I hope you've enjoyed the video and we'll see you next time. Well, hopefully we passed. We passed. <laughs>